So before we move on from uh, apprenticeship system and the classical academies that uh, grew out of the apprenticeship system, um, I'm going to mention my own master, uh, Fernando Fridas. Um, when I first met him, the Academy of Realist Art in Toronto was still the Angel Academy. And uh, at least for part of the year, Michael John Angel was still making visits. Um, there are two separate schools now, Angel Academy and ARA, but uh, back around 2001, uh, Angel was still around. Because I was a beginner, I was doing uh, the bark drawing exercises, and though I was doing some figure drawing, uh, Michael John Angel himself was doing figure painting with the senior students, you could call them. And I had the most contact with Fernando because among his other responsibilities, he ran the figure drawing classes. And uh, he also introduced students to the bark drawing exercises. So a future video will deal with um, the bark system and the classical academic systems as they survive in the 21st century. But uh, I thought I'd just give a shout out to Fernando. Now, you might recall from the discussion on um, the apprenticeship system, um, just like in dance or classical music or in many other things, adolescence, early adolescence, in some cases, late childhood is the time when you want to start devoting yourself to your craft. Um, 31 or 32, however old I was, I think it was about 31 years old, that's way too late to meet uh, your master who's going to connect you with, uh, you know, the centuries of the past, but uh, better late than never. Um, there's another way we can look at how visual art in the Western world went from the Renaissance to the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, three artists in particular. And what we're going to be looking for when we go through these pictures is not how they represent the Renaissance, the Baroque, and the Impressionist periods, but rather we're going to uh, look at how their own evolution can be traced through looking at early, middle, and late period works of their own. So we go back to the Baroque, have a look at, well, we'll even go back a little farther, go back to the classical era, and you might recall that when we went way back to the archaic period, sculptures were a bit stiff. Uh, they're often even symmetrical, but certainly not the contraposta kind of animated gestures that we saw in the later classical era. And then there was uh, Lacan, Lacun, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the sculpture of, um, I forget the mythological story. I think it's some guy and his sons and they're struggling with a serpent. But this sculpture was unearthed and I think more than any other piece of visual art, or at least let's say top 10, I'm not an expert on the birth of the Renaissance, but certainly this was a major discovery or rediscovery. And people, including Michelangelo, got quite excited about this sculpture when it was unearthed. So maybe we'll start from there. I also like to use this example because there's echoes of the kind of dynamism and movement that we're going to be looking at again when we get to the Baroque. So it's a nice clue to, you know how I was saying in an individual artist's evolution, there might be little clues in their early work of some of the themes, content, approaches that they are, they'll be known for in their later work. Well, this sculpture was a bit of a preview of the Baroque because, you know, the classical era, I, I, I'll, I'll look up the date and when I attach the image, I'll include the date, but it's way, way before 
medieval or Renaissance, let alone Baroque. But uh, it's really, in many ways, a, a, a Baroque sculpture. If we look at that, then we can look at how the kind of realistic anatomy, I mean, it's idealized. Those guys, they look more like weightlifters than your average Joe, but still, scientifically accurate anatomy and uh, all, you know, the sort of expressive gesture that started to animate sculpture when we moved from the late medieval into the, well, when we moved from the early Renaissance to the high Renaissance. So, for example, if we look at, uh, I'm going to look at my list of images just to refresh my memory where we're going to be at here. Yeah, so those figures from Chart, um, they're really good. They do have gesture, but it's not the contraposta, it's not the dynamic gesture, and it's certainly not the anatomical features of the High Renaissance. So you can see the changes in Donatello and in the David. But um, those figures, even though they kind of live and breathe and have, you know, muscles are tense here, they're relaxed here, there's that kind of serpentine spinal column of the contraposta, but still it's not the high energy dynamism of uh, Baroque. So Baroque is a lot of things. Uh, sometimes it's classed as a reaction to the Counter-Reformation. Um, I don't want to go too much into the history, but um, uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King of the American Civil Rights Movement, but Martin Luther, the he was a protester, and the Protestant religions are uh, named after that protest movement, which was uh, concerned about the excesses and the corruption and all kinds of other issues with the, with the Catholic Church. But the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation are the context for the split between the Papist, the Pope following Catholics, and then the Protestant religions and eventually of things like the Church of England and Protestantism was a big deal in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. But the Baroque, some people uh, describe it as a kind of a PR campaign for the old style church, saying, you know, these Protestants, they don't want to have any fun. They're not into exuberance or beauty or, um, you know, they were a bit sort of on the ascetic side. And uh, that's one way of thinking about Baroque. Another way of thinking about Baroque is uh, Baroque was originally meant to be derogatory. Um, it kind of meant over the top or overdone or, um, well, you'll see, I'll show you uh, uh, an image of, of a Baroque uh, interior. This is the Paris Opera House. This is actually from the 19th century. It's in the Napoleon III style. But Napoleon III style just means a mishmash of different architectural styles of the past. And uh, this, even though it's not from the Baroque era, is an excellent example, a magnificent example of, of a Baroque interior. So you get the idea that it's not aesthetic at all. It's actually quite full of motion and dynamism. So let's go back to our friend David. We looked at Donatello's David, we looked at Michelangelo's David, and now we're going to look at Bernini's David. And you can see that Bernini hasn't ignored the anatomical and other technical advancements of the Renaissance, but there's a kind of passion, drama, and energy that is belonging more to the Baroque style. If you look at that central figure, actually, it's quite reminiscent of a Renaissance painting. Um, the Oh, you'll have to read the title because I forget what this painting's called, but uh, it's in the National Gallery. I had uh, I've spent many, many afternoons staring at this painting and 
some other favorites of mine when I was uh, at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, that's kind of just like that Lacoon was um, a preview of Baroque sculpture. This painting, though it belongs to the Renaissance, is a bit of a preview of the Baroque style. The names associated, the first name associated with the Baroque would probably be Rubens. So this same kind of dramatic, energetic, um, colorful sort of imagery is what uh, we think of when we talk about the Baroque. So we can look at, uh, uh, um, I'll dig up a Rubens to show you, it's a good example. So not to confuse you, that Titian is not from the Baroque, it's from the Renaissance, but part of the reason I show it to you is because it is a good example of a Baroque image. It's also a good example of how these styles are not hard and fast. You could have people during the Baroque era painting in a Renaissance style, etc., etc. So to appreciate the Baroque era of painting and artists such as Rembrandt, there's a transitional figure, Caravaggio. So Caravaggio, um, I guess we call him early Baroque. I'm not sure exactly late Renaissance. But um, you, re you might remember we were looking at chiaroscuro, like um, I'll, uh, I'll remind us of the, uh, maybe I'll dig up that Leonardo uh, Madonna on the rocks. We have the images. Uh, now this use of light and dark, chiaroscuro, when it's done in this very smoky, dreamy sort of manner, it's fumato, which I think is Italian for smoky. Um, but Caravaggio, he developed chiaroscuro, but he tried to set it up in the real world in front of him and then depict what he's seeing with his eyes very accurately. So he would set up uh, 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 figures in this dramatic lighting and uh, this close physical observation of the way objects look, especially from a single light source. Um, meaning there's there's one like beam of light coming from uh not necessarily a beam of right light but directional light coming from one direction so that uh um you can leave areas in deep shadow or complete blackness and that's i think that's um what's it called tenebrism so tenebrism is this caravaggio-esque approach to uh chiaroscuro Sorry for all the technical terms, but to put it simply, the kind of dramatic light and dark that we saw championed by artists like um, Leonardo and to some extent Raphael, Tisch and other Renaissance artists, it was made even more dramatic. And drama really is a key, uh, a key word for the Baroque. Drama in terms of action, energy, movement, lighting, any way you want to approach it. So Caravaggio's tenebrism could be very, very dramatic. And this boiling the world down into this like black void with dramatic directional light and a very careful observ observation of figures painting from life um, was very, very influential on uh, Baroque artists, uh, in particular Rembrandt. So we're going to move on to Rembrandt, but uh, I'm going to have a tea break first. Uh, we're going to be burning through a lot of stuff here. <laughs> 